Good evening. Uh, a very warm welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York and to our eighth season of the Artisan Lecture Series. I am Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Tonight's program is a joint partnership with the Huguenot Society of America, and we're so pleased to have this opportunity to collaborate with them. I'd also like to express our appreciation to Thomas Donahue, our window curator, who has installed a special window display for tonight's talk. The General Society was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of New York City. 22 artisans at that time founded the society. These included blacksmiths, silversmiths, goldsmiths, saddlers, tailors, and many other trades. Today, our 233-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition-free mechanics institute, our lock museum, and by the way, if uh, you, you're free to uh, visit the lock museum after the program this evening, uh, which is the John M. Mossman lock collection, uh, the General Society Library, of course, which you're in this evening, and our nearly 200 century old lecture series of which tonight's program is part of. You will find additional information on the General Society on the blue and white postcard on your seat. I'm now very pleased to introduce to you Philip A. Rieser, who is president of the Huguenot Society and will say a few words about the society and also introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, again, my name is Philip Reeser, and I'm the president of the Huguenot Society of America. We're very pleased to be collaborating with the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen on our very first program together. Um, I thank Karen Taylor, Victoria Dangle of the General Society, as well as Cora Michael of the Huguenot Society of America for helping to organize this program. Uh, the Huguenot Society of America was founded in 1883 with the general focus on keeping the history of our Huguenot ancestors alive. That history is filled with many notable artisans who had skills that enriched the communities that became their new homes after they left France. Tonight, we had the pleasure of hearing a master in that field of scholarship. Tessa Murdoch is an expert on Huguenot designers and craftsmen in Great Britain and Ireland, and has created both exhibitions and scholarly writing on the topic. Since 2002, she has served as the deputy keeper, sculpture, metalwork, ceramics, and glass, and head of metalwork at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Dr. Murdoch has helped acquire Huguenot de decorative objects for their permanent collection. Among her many publications on Huguenot crafts is Beyond the Border, Huguenot Goldsmiths in Northern Europe and North America from 2008. Tessa, I very, mu very much look forward to hearing your talk and uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Philip, for that very warm and kind introduction. It is a great honor to be here this evening, and I feel uh, really challenged by the thought that there's been 200 years of lectures before mine tonight. So I hope I can live up to that history. And it is history that we're going to be speaking about um, this evening. Uh, and I'm going to go straight in to the heart of London, Threadneedle Street in the city of London, where the first Huguenot church in the great English metropolis was established by a special grant from the boy Protestant king, Edward VI, in 1550. So that's, gosh, almost 500 years ago. By the late 16th century, Huguenot artists, designers, and craftsmen were well established in that great city of London. This evening, I'm going to focus on the period of greatest Huguenot refuge from the early 1680s, when the persecution of the Protestants in France resulted in the revocation of the edict that had been signed at Nantes by the French king, Henry IV, in 1598. This edict, which provided Protestants in France with a degree of toleration 
for their faith was revoked at Fontainebleau by King Louis XIV in October 1685. Excitingly, it's recently been shown that contrary to earlier opinion, the British Isles became the most popular place of Huguenot refuge over and above the Netherlands. Part of the reason for this must be that the French Protestants who settled in this country were joining well-established communities founded by French emigres two, three, or four generations earlier. And they, of course, were willing to welcome, accept, and accommodate the new arrivals. These communities had both the traditions and the financial resources to facilitate the establishment of new Huguenot businesses and craft practices, which built on those already well established. Currently, the great museum for which I am honored to work, the Victorian Albert Museum, is engaged in a very special project known as the James Lemon Research Project. And this demonstrates the importance of the Huguenot contribution to the burgeoning silk industry established by Huguenot immigrants in Canterbury and then famously in London's Spitalfields area to the east of the city and eventually further afield in regional Sudbury, Suffolk and Macclesfield in Cheshire. The last few months have seen the publication of a remarkable study of silversmiths in Elizabethan and Stuart, London, by David Mitchell, 2017, drawing on the archives of the Guild of the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths in London. And this scholarly volume, much recommended, illustrates and documents the work of several first-generation Huguenot goldsmiths, including the maker whose beautiful cup I show on the screen, Noe or Noah Yepard, a stranger goldsmith from the city of Mons, who was sworn to the goldsmith's company in 1566, and who was by 1568 an independent goldsmith in the parish of St. Vidas, Foster Lane, in the heart of the city of London. Gepard is recorded as a member of that original French church in Threadneedle Street, already 18 years earlier. He was a denizen in 1579, and he was still a member of the French church 20 years later, in March 1600, when he witnessed and stood godfather at a baptism there. In July 1606, his widow was also a witness at a baptism at that church. He made the cup that's on the screen, which is preserved in the Worshipful Company Goldsmiths Collection to this day. The Latin inscription on the inside of the bowl indicates that this was given to one Maria Corbett on the occasion of her baptism in 1587. Interestingly, for those of you who are familiar with the greatest collections, private collections of silver, this particular cup was in the collection of Lord Swathling of the Jewish Montague family, a collection that was sold at Christie's in London in May 1924, whence the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths acquired it. I believe there are a number in the audience who are particularly interested in the history of orology, and I have deliberately se selected some good examples of Huguenot craftsmanship in that area, often overlooked in that they're associated with silk and silver, but their contribution to clock and watchmaking is just as important, if not even more so. Here on the screen, I show you a lantern clock in a handsome silver case made by David Bouquet. He was first admitted to the Blacksmiths Company in 1628 in the city of London, but in 1632, he joined the new, newly founded Clockmakers Company as a founder member. The company was keen to attract foreign members for their skill, particularly as case makers. We know that David Bouquet was living outside the city of London 
outside the city walls with a Mr. Sampson in Blackfriars, where he had two apprentices living with him. David Bouquet later served as an elder of the French church in Threadneedle Street for periods of three years, four times between 1637 and 1662. Of his three sons, two, named David and Solomon, you note that the Huguenots often had biblical names. David and Solomon became watchmakers, and Hector, not a biblical name, I think, was apprenticed to Isaac Maubert, a diamond cutter. Bouquet's clocks and watches are distinguished by their fine cases, with the example I show you on the screen. One watch at the British Museum, for which sadly I don't have an illustration, has a gold case enameled in black and overlaid with floral decoration in realistic colors. Inside, the dial is enameled with a painted landscape, and on the cover, there's an impressive array of 92 foil-set diamonds, obviously to the link with the Maubert diamond cutters in the family, produced this lavish confection. But this silver-cased bracket clock on display in the British galleries at the v &A, signed by Bouquet, is an equivalent luxury product. Intriguingly, there are links between the Maubert family and the Pantin family, a marriage between Elizabeth Maubert and Isaiah Pantin at the Threadneedle Street Church in 1658, and Pantin's second marriage to Mary Bouquet, widow of Isaac Maubert, indicates that the Bouquet, Maubert, and Pantin families were closely interconnected. The leading goldsmith, Simon Pantin, son of Simon Pantin and Jean Maubert, became free by apprenticeship to Pierre Harache, one of the first goldsmiths to join the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths in 1682. Simon Pantin went on to become a member of livery of the company by 1712. He took his own son, also named Simon, as an apprentice in May 1717. His grandson, Louis Pantin, was a clock case maker, and there's a signed example of his clock cases as far afield as Beijing in the Palace Museum. I'm going to introduce you to the Grignon family. In 1688, Daniel Grignon arrived in London as a refugee from Poitou. With his son Thomas, who was born in London in 1703, Daniel became a finisher to the celebrated London goldsmith, Daniel Quare. Quare was based in Change Alley, near the Stock Exchange in the City of London, and he was well placed to turn his profits as a clock and watchmaker um, into capital. Apparently, he hosted a marriage feast for his daughter and invited 300 people, including the Princess of Wales. But Quare died in 1724, and the Grignons established their business uh, in uh, following on from Daniel Quares. Their premises were at the King's Arms and Dial in Russell Street, Covent Garden, indicating the tendency of the French craftsmen to move to the west of the City of London, where they were closest to the court and the market for luxury goods. Here they sold and made watches and clocks and all sorts of curious toys, not children's toys, but sophisticated adult accessories. On the left of the screen, I show you uh, a portrait drawing of uh, Thomas Grignon by his younger brother, Charles, who studied drawing with Thomas Gainsborough at Gravelot, another French emigres, drawing school in Covent Garden. Intriguingly, the inscription on the back of the drawing, which you can just see showing through the blue paper, indicates that the sketch was undertaken when Thomas had just returned from Paris, aged 24, in 1737, demonstrating that by the early 18th century, it was possible for Huguenot craftsmen to return to their native land. Not always, but certainly from time to time. 
This is a particularly fine watch by James de Beaufre in the V&A collections. Uh, Jacob de Beaufre, with his father Peter, left Paris for London in the 1680s. Peter, the elder, was admitted to the Clockmakers' Company in 1689. They were living to the west of the city in Leicester Fields by 1695, and they were both naturalized in London in 1704. They introduced the use of harder bearings for pivot holes in watch movements with the assistance of the outstanding Geneva mathematician, Nicolas Fascio. In his youth, Fascio had measured the height of Mont Blanc from the terrace of his family's chateau and drafted a map of Lake Geneva. In London, Fascio was elected to the Royal Society at the comparatively young age of 24. The trio tried the hardest stones available. They found the diamond was too hard to pierce and too easily cleft by use, and so they settled for the next hardest materials. They pierced rubies and used them as bearings and end stones for the balance staff. Later, they used sapphires and agates. Their joint application for the extension to a patent granted in May 1704 for the use of jeweling in watches was presented to the House of Commons. Headed, an art of working precious or more common stones, whether natural or artificial, crystal or glass, and certain other matters different from metals, so that they may be employed and made use of in clockwork and watchwork, and many other engines, nor for ornament only, but as an internal and useful part of the work or engines itself, in such manners as have not heretofore been used. However, their patent was opposed by the clockmakers' company, who claimed that other members had used jeweled pivots before 1704, and the watch that Fascio submitted actually had a fake jewel. Peter de Brof also invented a deadbeat or club-footed verge escapement with two escape wheels, having between them a truncated cone formed of a diamond, and cut away at the side to form an impulse plane acted on by the wheels alternately. Sir Isaac Newton had a watch with this feature and spoke favourably at its performance. James de Boeuf, whose watch is on the screen, was Jacob's younger brother, born in London in 1691, admitted to the Clockmakers' Company in 1712 with an address in Church Street, Soho. This gold watch has an outer case set with panels of coloured glass imitating agate. James's only son, Joseph, married Susanna, the daughter of the celebrated goldsmith Paul de Lamry in 1750. The British Museum has fine examples of specialist watch movements. Re Peter Garron, born 1673 to Huguenot parents, was apprenticed in London to an English maker, Richard Baker. Initially, he was refused admission to the clockmaker's company as an alien, but he was later granted the freedom by the intervention of the Lord Mayor and admitted in 1694. So he was a maker of varied, unusual timepieces. The British Museum has an example of a sun and moon watch, which indicates day and night hours by a pointer attached respectively to the sun and moon, swinging across the sector dial. The minute hand sweeps the entire circumference, and the watch has an added rare feature at this date of a separate second dial. Alas, his bankruptcy was noted in the London Gazette in October 1706. Another new development was the Wandering Hour Watch. This example is signed by Stephen Boisson, who may have been based in Geneva, but signed his movements, Etienne Boisson, London. Made for the English market, the cases were probably made in London. The type of watch is named from the manner in which the minutes and hours are displayed. The upper arc shows minutes and an hour indicator, Roman numerals, swings across below it, marking by its position the number of minutes elapsed since the last hour. The inner arc of numbers shows the quarters. A useful source for information about the transfer of skills from master to apprentice is R. Campbell's The London Tradesman, published in 1747. 
It's a manual of trades calculated for the information of parents and instruction of youth in their choice of business. Under the heading Watchmaker, Campbell lists six categories of specialisation, with apprenticeship fees varying from £10 to £30 for the main trade, £5 to £10 for the movement maker, spring maker, chain maker, case cap maker and finisher. By 1747, Campbell could claim that the watchmaker's business is but of modern invention and of late improved in England to the highest perfection. We beat all Europe in clocks and watches of all sorts and export those useful engines to all parts of the known world. Of late years, the watchmaker scarce makes anything belonging to watch. He only employs the different tradesmen amongst whom the art is divided and puts the several pieces of the movement tighter and adjusts and finishes it. Watches about 60 years ago went upon catgut instead of a chain and were affected by every change of weather. It was morally impossible to adjust them to any fixed certainty. But since the invention of the chain and our improvement in the temper of springs, our watches are reduced to certain principles upon which the weather, at least in our climate, can have no effect. The next improvement watches and clocks received was the invention of engines for cutting the teeth in the several parts of the movement, which were formerly cut by hand. This reduced the expense of workmanship and time to trifle in comparison to what it was before and brought the work to such an exactness that no hand can imitate it. The movement maker forges his wheels of brass to the just dimensions, sends them to the cutter, and has them cut at a trifling expense. He has nothing to do when he takes them from the cutter but to finish them and turn the corners of the teeth. The pinions made of steel are drawn at the mill, so the watchmaker only has to file down the pivots and fix them to their proper wheels. The springs are made by a tradesman who does nothing else, and the chain by another. These last, the chains, are frequently made by women in the country about London and sold to the watchmaker by the dozen for a very small price. It requires no great ingenuity to learn to make watch chains. The instruments made for that use renders the work quite easy, which to the eye would appear very difficult. There are workmen who make nothing else but the caps and studs for watches, and silversmiths who only make cases, and workmen who cut the dial plates or enamel them, which of late has become so much the fashion. When the watchmaker has got home all the movements of the watch and the other different parts of which he consists, he gives the whole to a finisher, who puts the whole machine together, having first had the brass wheels gilded by the gilder, adjust it to the proper time. The watchmaker puts his name upon the plate and is esteemed the maker, though he has not made in his shop the smallest wheel belonging to it. It is supposed, however, that he can make all the movements, and apprentices are learned still to cut them by hand. The watchmaker must be a good judge of the goodness of the work at first sight and put his name to nothing but what will stand the severest trial, for the price of a watch depends upon the reputation of the maker only. So what do you need to become a watchmaker? All the branches require a mechanic head, a light, nice hand, to touch those delicate instruments with which they make pivots almost imperceptible and a strong sight, there being scarce any trade which required a quicker eye or steadier hand. The profit of the master is considerable, and a journeyman has as much as he can earn, for they are generally paid by the piece. A finisher may earn 30 or 40 shillings a week if constantly employed. It requires no great strength nor much education to make a practical watchmaker, but a man who intends to be master of the theory ought to have a tolerable education, should have some smattering of mechanics and mathematics. He may be bound about 14, or sooner if he is tolerably acute. The trade is not much overstocked in town, and no trade has better encouragement in our plantations or in any other part of Europe. If he understands his business, he may have bread almost anywhere. The contribution of Huguenot refugee goldsmiths to the London trade is well known. Two French goldsmiths were made free of the company by redemption in 1682, three years before the revocation. Louis Berchier, a jeweler from Paris and a diamond merchant, 
agreed to give a customary piece of plate to the company on joining. Mr. Maubert, it's probably Nicholas Maubert, agreed to be surety for Louis Bercher. In November 1682, Henry Compton, Bishop London, great friend of the Huguenots, proposed that Jean-Louis, a brother-in-law of Louis Bercher, be made free by redemption. But this was only agreed after Bishop Compton promised not to press his case in the cause of any other alien goldsmith again. So some of these talented craftsmen came from Paris. On the left, a very familiar engraving of the refuge of the Huguenots, often leaving with only the clothes they stood up in. On the right, a very moving print published by the Society of Parisians, Huguenot refugees who had come from Paris, who banded together to support each other in time of sickness and to pay for burial. And this is in the form of an engraving of their great temple at Charenton outside Paris, where they were permitted to worship until the revocation insisted on the temple being demolished just three days after Louis XIV revoked uh, the Edict of Nantes in 1685. So Pierre Harache, who came originally from Rouen but was associated to Paris, on entering the Goldsmiths Company, had his certificate signed by ministers and elders of the French church at Threadneedle Street and the Savoy in the West End. These are to certify all whom it may concern that Peter Harache, lately come from France to avoid persecution and live quietly, is not only a Protestant, but by his majesty's bounty is made a free denizen that he may settle here freely with his family. In token whereof, we have given this certificate the 28th of June, 1682. Harash is probably uh, the most talented of the first generation Huguenot goldsmiths to settle in London. And I show you here this very splendid ewer and basin made by Harash for the first Duke of Devonshire. Today, it's part of the bequest that Peter Wilding left to the British Museum and has just been very beautifully displayed. So if you find yourself in London uh, next week, I think Philip's going to be there before the end of the month, I would urge you to go to the British Museum to admire the new display. From 1681, when the numbers of refugees from France increased markedly, the Goldsmiths Company was forced unwillingly to modify its position and omit a number of Huguenot goldsmiths by redemption. 11 in all between 1682 and 1699. These men each took several apprentices from Huguenot families. So by 1714, there was a group of more than 30 Huguenot goldsmiths who were free of the company. Their work is particularly associated with sculptural ornament, transferring the status of secular silver. Campbell in 1747 wrote, that as workers in metal, especially of the finer metals, goldsmiths need to form sensible figures, either by casting them in moulds or forming them with a hammer, and they may be reckoned of some kindred to sculpture and statuary. So notice the very spectacular human form of the handle on Harash's helmet-shaped ewer. Of course, as a goldsmith, as well as mastering tools, and the process of hammering and molding. The goldsmith needed to be able to understand uh, the uh, science of metal alloy. Campbell mentions that the new introduction of flatting mills in the mid 18th century reduced uh, the labor involved in producing the thin uh, silver that was needed in creating uh, the cut card work of decoration uh, round, for example, the foot of the ewer that is very much associated with Huguenot work. So the goldsmith must be conversant in alchemy in all the properties of metals, and he must know the proper menstruums for their solution, methods of extracting and refining them, the secret of mixing them, and assaying metals, and distinguishing the real from the fictitious. Once again, education was important. Designing, the chief part of his early study, previous to his apprenticeship. But of course, the cost of setting up a large stock uh, meant 
the need to be able to network and essential to have a superficial knowledge of Latin, but a working knowledge of French, the polite court language of Europe, and a trading tongue spoke or understood in all cities where traffic flourishes. Of course, the Huguenot refugees had a great advantage, French being their mother tongue. You can see here from this invitation to um, a feast at the Goldsmiths Company, which is signed uh, by Louis Mette, uh, one of the first generation Huguenot goldsmiths, the many different skills that could be found uh, in a goldsmith's workshop. This dates from 1707. The goldsmith employs several distinct workmen, almost as many as there are different articles in his shop. For in this great city, there are hands that excel in every branch and are constantly employed, but in that one of which they are masters. This gives us an advantage over many foreign nations in this article, as they are obliged to employ the same hands in every branch of the trade, and it's impossible to expect that a man employed in such an infinite variety can finish his work to any perfection, at least not so much as he who is constantly employed in one thing. The moral of the division of labor. Here's a close-up of that ewer by Pierre Harache, and I think you can see clearly um, some of the extraordinary quality that typifies the work of the Huguenot goldsmiths, the sculptural handle, um, the cast-applied shell, the beautiful color, uh, quantity of the um, engraving, probably the work of Blaise Jonteau, another immigrant from France, and very clearly uh, the decorative form of the cut card work. In fact, the native goldsmiths objected because they felt that applying this cut sheet silver as ornament would artificially increase the weight of each article because of the quantity of solder that would be needed to achieve it. I mentioned Simon Pantin, who also, like Harash, came from Rouen, although his family was probably established in the city of London before the revocation. He worked in the West End, um, and as we've heard, took his son uh, as apprentice. Because 2018 is a year of special significance uh, for women in the United Kingdom, celebrating 100 years of women's suffrage, it seemed appropriate to uh, celebrate the extraordinary role played by women uh, of Huguenot descent in maintaining uh, the, their husband's business after their death. Simon Pantin's daughter, Elizabeth, uh, married first Abraham Bouter and took over her first husband's business, and then uh, Benjamin Godfrey. And here are some interesting examples of double-lit source boat on the right, marked by Elizabeth Bouter, and this more Rococo form on the left, marked by the same uh, lady as Elizabeth Godfrey. Louis Cuny, another first-generation goldsmith, uh, appears in the Denization List in 1697, free of the goldsmith's company by redemption in 1703, working just near Leicester Fields elected to the livery of the company in 1708, his son Samuel apprenticed to him. I show you here a design for the extension for the Huguenot Church of the Savoy uh, in Westminster, given for the use of the Huguenot community by Charles II in the early 1660s, provided they used the Anglican liturgy translated into French, as opposed to the non-conformist liturgy of the Threadneedle Street Church. But as the church expanded, they needed an extension, hence Christopher Wren's design, and they needed more equipment for the communion. And on the right, you see two cups and two patterns made by Louis Cuny. And there, from the wonderful publication Bam, Bernard Picard, Comparative Religions of the 1720s onwards, is uh, an image of communion at a French church in the United Provinces. Notice the segregation of the sexes, the women sitting round the table, interspersed by ministers, passing the bread and communion along 
uh, the table, imitating uh, the Last Supper, but in almost secular style. I wanted to share with you some exquisite uh, communion silver made by Isaac Liger, a first-generation goldsmith from Saumur. You notice that many of the craftsmen come from regions in France. Again, he's recorded in London by 1700. Interestingly, he becomes free of the company of broderers or embroiderers, so they didn't all register with the company that represented their trade. He, too, was working in the West End, in the parish of St. Martin in the Fields. His greatest patron was George Booth, 2nd Earl of Warrington, for whom he worked from 1708, supplying this wonderful altar set on the left for Warrington's Chapel at Dunham Massey in Cheshire, now the property of the National Trust, and much recommended if you want to see some of the finest uh, Huguenot silver to survive. We know that Liger worked very closely with Simon Gribelin, uh, the engraver, also a member of the Clockmakers Company, who came from a distinguished family of clock and watchmakers in Blois and published books of ornament. But here, the altar dish is engraved with a deposition from the cross after Anibali Karachi, and Gribelin took a print from the engraved silver dish and uh, pasted it into an album recording highlights of his work, which can be studied today at the British Museum. I particularly love this uh, sketch by J.T. Smith of the young Hogarth, who resented his apprenticeship as a silver engraver. But it gives you a very clear idea of the way in which the light was filtered in order to provide um, the appropriate context and the young apprentice bringing uh, yet another salver for the unwilling Hogarth to engrave with a coat of arms. On the wall is the trade card of his master, Ellis Gamble. Well, Hogarth is uh, often given uh, the uh, engraving of this wonderful salver made for Robert Walpole, our first prime minister, uh, on silver made by Paul de Lamery. And Paul de Lamery's master was Pierre Platel, who made this pilgrim bottle uh, for the Churchill family in 1714, uh, which is also in the V&A. The Platel, um, Pierre, and his brother Claude arrived in England in the train of William III. Of course, uh, William III's Protestant monarchy after the Catholic James II was greeted um, with great enthusiasm by the Huguenots. And it's interesting that several of the goldsmiths uh, made sure that their sons had the very best education. Uh, so Pierre Platel's son, Peter, studied theology at Queen's College, Cambridge, and became um, a vicar. And as I've mentioned, Platel's most famous apprentice was Paul de Lamery. Daniel Garnier was the son of Isaac Garnier, apothecary at the Royal Hospital in Chelsea that was founded by Charles II. Uh, he was probably one of the most talented of the first generation goldsmiths. Here is a splendid tankard in English form, noticed again the very sophisticated cut card work and, this was, and engraving. This was recently acquired by the National Museum of Wales as part of the very splendid collection of Huguenot silver put together for that great Jewish financier, Ernest Castle, uh, in the early years of the 20th century. Closer at hand at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, you can admire a silver chandelier uh, created by Daniel Garnier for King William III's state apartments at Hampton Court. Tragically, Garnier died in 1699, uh, and it would have been uh, very interesting to see what he'd produced had he continued. I wanted to introduce David Viom from Metz, um, who is particularly interesting for the way in which he was assimilated into English society, recorded as working as a goldsmith in Charing Cross. He married uh, Spitalfields, the daughter of a Huguenot minister in 1690, became free 
um, of the city in the 1693 livery of the Goldsmiths Company five years later. He set up premises in St. James's Street, not just as a goldsmith, but also as a banker, and built up a considerable profit, which enabled him to retire in 1728, when he purchased the manor of Tingrith in Bedfordshire, close to one of his leading patrons, the, first, uh, the Dukes of Bedford. His son was apprenticed to his father, also named David. In fact, while still an apprentice, was sent by his father back to the family home in Metz to claim inheritance. He eventually married Elizabeth, the daughter of Charles Dimmock of Ampthill in Bedfordshire, and became High Sheriff of Bedfordshire in 1737. So it is a classic example of absorption into landed English society. Here is a very handsome wine fountain for rinsing wine glasses made by David Viome for one of the most important patrons of the day, Rafe Montague, um, who became the first Duke of Montague. He has examples of work by Louis Metier, um, who was related to David Viome by marriage. Another uh, remarkable lady goldsmith, Anne Tanqueray, is the daughter of David Viome the Elder, brother, uh, sister of David Viome the Younger. Uh, and she, in customary fashion, married her father's apprentice, David Tanqueray, who was the son uh, of a silk weaver. Uh, I'm particularly excited that this very handsome pair of double-lipped sauce boats are um, in the process of acquisition jointly by the Victorian Albert Museum and the newly established Huguenot Museum in Rochester in Kent. Um, they're with Tim Shrubsole here in New York City, and I had the excitement of being able um, to handle them yesterday. So we're busy um, acquiring the necessary funds. Uh, Anne Tanqueray took her husband's mark with the rising sun, but uh, contained it in the lozenge shape, which indicates um, her female identity. Well, Pese Pilo from Le Mans had a speciality in providing false teeth, and I particularly enjoy um, his trade card, which shows a handsome two-handle cup, such as the example sold by Christie's, with little semicircles of dentures. By 1696, uh, the daily newspaper, The Postma Postman, uh, announced Mr. Pilo, a French goldsmith, does give notice that by an experience of 18 years, he's found out a way to make and set artificial teeth in so firm a manner that one may actually chew with them. He was succeeded by his son of the same name who continued with that speciality. So just to remind you how false teeth might have appeared in the 18th century, thanks to the British Dental Association Museum um, in London. And these, again, from uh, the Mountbatten uh, Castle family, uh, a pair of gold chocolate cups which are actually made by John Chartier, um, a goldsmith from Blois. But they were made out of recycled memorial rings for Anne Houblon, Lady Palmerston, who Judy Rudeau, the curator at the British Museum, reckons, having weighed them, um, that each of these gold cups uh, represents 11 memorial rings. So I think Anne Houblon had inherited a rather large quantity of memorial rings in a little chest and decided it would nice to fashion them, and then use them appropriately to drink every morning bitter chocolate with her husband, remembering members of the Huguenot Houblon family, of course celebrated for the role that they played in founding the Bank of England, and Sir John Houblon was the first governor of that uh, extraordinary institution, which of course, ironically, helped to finance the wars against the French. And here you can see that some of the mottos that were presumably uh, on the rings that were recycled are re-engraved. Um, he has not deserved sweet, who has not tasted bitter. If you remember, chocolate was drunk, black was very bitter, before Sir Hans Sloane's recipe, which introduced the idea of adding milk, uh, became customary. So I've concentrated this evening on the Huguenot contribution to the metal trades, 
but I could give another lecture on their contribution to furniture and carving and gilding. For example, on the left, uh, Pierre Gaulle, Louis XIV's cabinet maker, this beautiful ivory cabinet, which is now in the European galleries at the British Museum, or, sorry, at the Victoria and Albert Museum, or in the middle, um, a very uh, sophisticated marquetry um, and gilt wood candle stand, uh, the work of Pierre Gaulle's son, Cornelius, who settled in London, uh, and the Pelletier family uh, from um, Paris. Here, another table um, at Bouton House, and Buclou collections on the left, and also from the same great house, uh, a portrait of Hortense Mancini, uh, Duchess of Mazarin, in a frame um, supplied by the Pelletier family workshop, with these characteristic corners and middles, based on designs by Daniel Marrow, um, Huguenot architect to the king. Well, I mentioned James Lemon at the beginning of this talk, born circa 1688, apprenticed in 1702 to his father, the eldest of six children. Lemon is remarkable because he was both um, a designer and a weaver and merchant of Spitalfield silks. His earliest designs are in the bizarre style, and the v &A has an album of some 90 designs currently um, being preserved. And actually, just a week ago, BBC One produced a 30-minute documentary on the Huguenot silk weavers, showing the work that's happening at the v &A, funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation here. We're very grateful for that support so that these designs can be conserved and photographed and put online and be available to a global audience. So Lemon was remarkable in being a manufacturer as well as a designer. In Lyon, in France, combining the two was common, but in London, this was exceptional. He eventually became renter bailiff of the Weavers Company, one of the highest offices in the company. But I was particularly excited recently to discover his name in the pew lists of uh, the Threadneedle Street Church, showing that that church that had been founded some 200 years earlier um, was still uh, the centre of the Huguenot community uh, in London. Mr. Campbell notes that Spitalfield weavers who all work in the silk manufacture are a numerous body. Weavers of flowered silks, damask, brocades and velvets, very ingenious tradesmen. They had to learn to draw to design their patterns. So a man acute with his pen in drawing could strike out new fancies and thus produce the most fashionable silks for demand. There were many connections between the silk weavers in the East End and the makers of luxury goods uh, in the West. And one of the most remarkable dynasties uh, is that of the Courtauld family, Augustine Courtauld uh, here. And we know that he occupied the house in the left of, actually to the right, sorry, of Hogarth's print of the enraged musician in Chandos Street, um, just above uh, the church of St. Martin's in the field. I think you can see little Chandos Street. His son, Samuel, apprenticed his father, was well placed to take advantage of the opportunity to draw from the living model at the St. Martin's Laid Academy nearby. Their premises, um, there's Louis Cheron, who founded the St. Martin's Lane Academy, uh, trained at the Royal Academy in Paris, so well able to share his skill. The Courtauld family workshop was close to that of the goldsmith and jeweller Peter Dutens, who in 1736 supplied, as you see on the right, this very sophisticated clock for Frederick, Prince of Wales, possibly as a wedding present for his royal bride, Princess Augusta, and this was recently acquired by the V&A. So even 50 years later, we find Francis Perigal supplying a long case clock for the use of the uh, French church in Threadneedle Street, and it still adorns the library there. And you can see Perigal's signature as an elder of the church. 
Here is the trade card of Marianne Viet, who continued uh, the business established by her husband, Claude Viet. Here is a handsome clock at Lime Park in Cheshire, which bears Claude Viet's signature. Surprisingly, it's only in the 1740s that David Hubert, a watch and clock maker, is inspired to establish a Protestant school for the Huguenots uh, in Westminster, and his portrait is preserved in the Huguenot Museum in Rochester. And the second generation continued. This is the trade card of Thomas Harash, uh, part of the Harash family, um, a gold snuff box by his brother Francis, and a chatelaine, again, uh, to be seen in the Huguenot Museum. Here is Samuel Courtauld's trade card, still in Chandos Street in St. Martin's Lane. He evidently specialized in providing very sophisticated chase silver. Again, the rising sun. And I show you this rather remarkable basin, unmarked, which is on loan and on display at the V&A. Perhaps it was supplied by Samuel Courtauld. Seems an interesting match. And then he moved to the city with premises in Cornhill, and his signature is to be found uh, in the book of the police and discipline of the Threadneedle Street Church. On his death, his business was taken over by Louisa Perina, who was the sister of Pierre Auger, another of these great Spitalfield silk merchants. And maybe that was another reason for Samuel moving uh, closer to Spitalfields, where the Auger family uh, were established. After her husband's death, Louisa registered a joint mark with her husband's former apprentice, George Cowles. George Cowles married her niece, Judith, who was a daughter of Samuel's sister, Anne, and the Huguenot Museum has recently acquired portraits of Anne Courtauld and her husband's husband, John Jacob, who was a talented silversmith uh, in his own right. So I juxtapose a basket by John Jacob from Christie's and a neoclassical covered vase uh, by Louisa Courtauld and George Cowles here um, on this side of the pond in Boston. Well, I want to end with perhaps a description of an unwilling apprentice. Abraham Portal, apprentice to Paul de Lamry in 1740. He was the son of a Huguenot vicar with a living in the Church of England, born in Derbyshire. Abraham's brother Andrew was in Geneva, and Abraham's letters to Andrew and poems whilst he was serving his apprenticeship provide insight. Although a talented craftsman, a silver bearing his maker's mark demonstrates, and I show you this rather wonderful um, altar set made for the chapel of the Asylum for Female Orphans. Abraham's heart was in literature. He eventually earned an entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography through his work as a playwright. In his youth, he sent his brother a verse describing his role as an apprentice. What sacred muse will now my thoughts inspire, ordain to touch with poetic fire? Should I, sweet Calliope, invoke thy aid? Our noisy tools would fright the tender maid. Do thou, great Cleo, then our toil rehearse, soften our noisy art in gentle verse. Six in the morning from the bed we rise, and rub the sleepy humour from our eyes. The tenacity of these dynasties of craftsmen and women that I've introduced this evening may be explained by the longevity of their commitment to their respective skills. Their faith had excluded them from certain professions in France. The skills acquired in certain crafts lent social status. The goldsmith's trade, as we've seen, could be combined with banking. And it's significant that there are several examples of successive generations achieving education at Oxford and Cambridge and taking ordination as Anglican clergy. Behind this engagement with education and the desire to share such knowledge lay an intellectual curiosity as craftsmen, developing scientific hobbies which informed their awareness of the natural world and their design skills. Judging from surviving examples of book plates, Paul de Lamry's is preserved in the Royal Library. Peter Romilly's, a jeweler of Fristit, uh, is preserved in the French Hospital Collection. Many of these talented Huguenot Londoners had private libraries, or the use of that acquired by the Threadneedle Street Huguenot Church 
from a member of the Bosenkert family. A new project to publish Huguenot family book plates and establish the publications to which they subscribed promises to throw further exciting light on this extraordinary exodus from France that contributed so much to the achievements of the luxury trades in London from the mid-16th century through to the mid-18th century. And I would like to invite you all to come to the United Kingdom to visit the French hospital now established in Rochester, where it provides sheltered housing for elderly people of proven Huguenot descent. Here is the original seal rendered in ceramic, showing Elijah being fed by the ravens. God will provide. Here is the charter granted by George I to the French hospital in 1718. The French hospital celebrates its tercentenary this year, and if you would like to join us in celebrating that with a great feast at the Garrick Club on the 19th of October 2018, you would be most welcome, and we would be delighted to arrange a number of visits in association. So that was the original French hospital as painted in the 19th century, just north of the city. And here is the Huguenot Museum, with an entrance just a stone's throw from the new station at Rochester, just 25 minutes from central London. So we're waiting to welcome you in London and in Rochester, Kent. And I thank you for your patience. I would be delighted to try and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Before we begin the Q&A, please remember that this is a, a recorded uh, presentation, so please wait until the microphone comes to you. Did the engravers uh, who came as well, such as Blaise Gentot, have to um, have the same restrictions as the goldsmiths, or perhaps as sort of executing their art as in the artistic realm, were they exempt as uh, those in the arts as opposed to the craftsman world? That's a very interesting question. Um, Simon Gribelin, presumably, because he was part of a, um, a dynasty of clock and watchmakers going back well, several generations, chose to become free of the clockmakers' company. And I suppose that gave him an additional authority. I think many of the engravers were probably um, attached to the larger workshops that I've tried to demonstrate this evening. Um, for example, there was um, a member of the Arash family uh, who worked as an engraver, we know from the registers of the Huguenot churches. But I, there wasn't um, a specialist guild for engravers. And I suppose one of the important um, qualifications to be able to work as an engraver on silver was, firstly, if you were working as an armorial engraver, that you had to understand the language of heraldry. Um, but if you were going to do the sort of work that Hogarth was doing on the Paul de Lamry uh, war pearl salver, you also needed to have mastered figurative uh, drawing. And that is where I think the presence of the St. Martin's Lane Academy was so important. If you think that uh, the Royal Academy of Art in London was only established in 1768. In fact, it's celebrating its 250th anniversary this year, so it's rather young by comparison with the French hospital. Question over there. Uh, I, I noticed that the, um, the time pieces, whether they're um, time pieces or, or clocks, that there was an element of industry as opposed to the solitary craftsperson so that you describe the chain makers um, and those who made the housings. Was that sort of a, um, a separate category that accepted that, um, they, that it, was, it was bordering on industry? I think it's an incredibly important example of the division and labor. And I think that specialization was dictated by um, a huge demand. 
uh, I mean, it's astonishing the numbers of movements and watches that were being produced, many for exportation. Uh, and as I hinted this evening, you get this very um, sophisticated international trade in the manufacture of watches with movements being made in Geneva um, for export to London where the cases would be made. And I think this is an extraordinarily important example of the uh, influence of the diaspora and international network. You get individuals from the same families who are settling in Geneva. And we've seen um, the young apprentice Portal writing to his brother in Geneva. So it, I think the international network is of extraordinary importance to the productivity and to their success. Um, Peter Duval, who's the deputy governor of the French hospital today and whose vision um, it was to create the Huguenot Museum, his ancestors were sort of jewelers merchants based in Geneva, in St. Petersburg and in London. And by the late 18th century, they produced a very hot line in sophisticated automata um, catering for the likes of Catherine the Great so she could give these sophisticated uh, luxury accessories to diplomats and so on. Um, and, it, and it's that network, it's that sort of business acumen which is sort of married to skill. So I think David Villon, the elder, is an extraordinary example of, of that, you know, combining his skill as a goldsmith and in running a workshop with offering banking facilities and then being able to invest those profits in land. I, I've heard two pronunciations tonight on Huguenot and Huguenot, and I just wondered which one is preferred. A Huguenot, this side of the pond, and Huguenot, the other side. I'm sorry if I slipped into my native tongue, but you say tomato and I say tomato? Uh -huh. So either one. Thank you. Yes, in Charleston, they've heard to use both. Even, even the natives. Was there some separation between the um, ordinary English people and the ordinary French, perhaps by language or, or something else? So the question is, was there a separation between the ordinary English people and the ordinary French in, in London? Yeah. It's complex. Uh, I think that, if you call them ordinary, that native goldsmiths would see the talent being um, epitomized in the work being produced by the Huguenot refugee goldsmiths. And if they were sensible, they would try and encourage them to come and work for the native goldsmiths so they could produce uh, silver to a higher quality, higher design. So you will get that sort of specialist assimilation. Uh, in a sort of more general way, um, there's a wonderful description by uh, that great man of letters and diplomat, Philip Stanhope, fourth Earl of Chesterfield. So this is some 50 years after the revocation. And he advises his sort of fashionable compatriots that if they want to improve their French, they should go to old Soho, where the venerable refugees are very friendly to strangers, lodgings and legumes are very cheap, and they will improve their French much faster than if they went to Paris, where they would probably be ignored by French people. Yeah, lady in green. Was there any um, influence by the Huguenots on the jewelry makers, uh, the goldsmiths, silversmiths in, the, in Birmingham? That's a very good question. Uh, we know that Matthew Bolton was absolutely fascinated by French techniques uh, and went to Paris and encouraged some of his associates to go to Paris to observe particularly 
the quality of gilding. Um, he was producing silver, but he was also producing ormolu, and I think it was the quality of gilding on ormolu that he, he was particularly fascinated by. But I think that awareness of excellence associated with techniques in France, and of course, sources such as Diderot's Encyclopédie would have helped to promote that awareness, uh, helped to raise the standard of productions in Birmingham. I th don't think there is much evidence of Huguenot presence in Birmingham. I think Birmingham really gets going as a kind of toy shop of Europe um, later in the 18th century. But, but maybe, maybe there is. Um, I'd be fascinated to know. So I don't really know the answer to your question. But I think you know, the French example was one to follow. Question. Can I just repeat my invitation? We would love to see you on the other side of the pond. Delighted to organize um, you know, a Huguenot tour and out to Rochester, maybe up to Boughton to see the wonderful home of the present Duke of Buccleu. Uh, his ancestor, the first Duke of Montague, was Louis XIV and was ambassador at the court of Louis XIV, those of you who've seen visiting Versailles, um, and got all his ideas of building and gardening from his visit to Versailles, came back and employed Huguenot designers and craftsmen to furnish his great home. Firstly, Montague House on the site of the British Museum, and Boughton, which still stands today. Montague House was the first home of the British Museum and then was demolished in the 19th century. So that is a real treat. So um, perhaps we could work with Philip to to organize such a trip if anybody's interested. Tessa, on uh, behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, uh, we would like to thank you so much for your wonderful, uh, eloquent, and so comprehensive uh, presentation. It was fascinating finding out about the transmission of the Huguenot skills in London. So thank you so very much. And we, thank you. Um, we'd, and we would also like to ex extend our thanks to the Huguenot Society who have organized this event. And as I said, we were delighted to have this opportunity to collaborate. And of course, especially Philip and Cora. So thank you. Um, Tessa, before you move away, <laughs> um, on occasions like these, we do make a presentation, and uh, to do so is our executive director, Victoria Dengel. Yes, and and thank you, Tessa, and I and we for this wonderful presentation for your. Uh, for, for your thoroughness, for your sh shining a light on that period of time. And I have to tell you, this, this building is um, constructed in 1890, and the society, as you know, was founded in 1785. And I can honestly say that not a day goes by that we don't look at this building and think of the craftsmanship and the legacy, and uh, we are the keepers of that, and you are the keepers of what we, was discussed tonight. And I know those people that are long gone are grateful that they're thought of so thoughtfully. So thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. So Tessa Murdoch, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to Tessa, Dr. Tessa Mur Murdoch, Deputy Keeper, Sculpture, Metalwork, Ceramics and Glass, and Head of Metalwork, Victoria and Albert Museum, London, for Master and Apprentice, the transfer of skills in the London Huguenot community from 1680 to 1760 for her participation in the General Society Artists and Lecture Series. So thank you, Tessa. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Look, isn't that, I've never had a certificate like that after oh. lecturing. I feel I might have graduated. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And, and Tessa, because we do want to see more of you, and we'd like to welcome you to your new home in Midtown, because you're now a, a, a lifetime library member of the oh, General God. Society Library. <laughs> I'll be back. Okay. Yes, of course. So much. You're welcome.
And well, because you said about the Locke Museum, we're going to also present Tessa with a copy of the Lure of the Locke that talks about 350 locks and keys. So you'll be, you'll be, we'll you'll be, compare, you'll have we'll a very. Have to compare the V&A collection you'll have of locks <laughs> and keys with it, the one on okay. here. Okay. Yes, 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 thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if we can quite compare yes. with the V&A, but we. Uh, <laughs> Um, and finally, in conclusion, uh, Tessa, just a little memento of the sea of this evening, a General Society tote bag, and this and the poster. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. I think right. you enjoy your window. So. I think right. my grandson.